Digital Nomad was a term that we were unfamiliar with when we opened. This is Steve Stein, and you're listening to Inside Asia, conversations with Asia's leading movers, shakers, thinkers, and provocateurs. My guest this episode is Peter Wall. That was his voice you heard just a second ago. Peter is a documentary filmmaker and co-founder of The Hub in Abud, a co-working space magically appointed in the hills of Bali. On any given day, the narrow streets of this erstwhile village teem with women in yoga pants and men with man buns. The place has a neo-hippie sheen about it, but increasingly, Ubud is the destination of a new generation of digital nomads, professionals in search of the prophetic work-life balance. The Hub in Ubud, or Hubud for short, is a destination of choice. It's a place where people from every possible background can come together to work, play, and create. It's hard to explain, but when juxtaposed to the whirling economic dervish of urban Asia, Bali remains a sanctuary for the soul, a place where mysticism and magic still abide. The Balinese are living proof of how progress and tradition can coexist. And believe me when I tell you that through their colorful rituals and daily practices, they, the Balinese, establish the rhythm of the island. Having based myself from Bali for the past five years, I can attest to the unique energy of this place. Humor me while I flirt with the inner neo-hippie. The word taksu might help. It's a word in the local dialect that blends the ideas of harmony, nature, and inspiration. It is more a feeling than an event, imbued with a sacred quality. It's like this. At this moment, I'm sitting in an antique one-room shack called a gledag. It sits surrounded by a thick jungle, and we use it as a kind of home office. The left wall has been replaced with a full pane of glass, giving me a framed view of the lush surroundings. Through the thin slats of wood, you can hear the sound of cicadas, wind chimes, the occasional cry of a rooster, and fluttering palm fronds. You get the picture. It might then seem odd that in the absolute tranquility of these surroundings, Peter Wall co-founded a workspace for techno-entrepreneurs. But as you'll hear, it actually makes a lot of sense. Peter spent five years living and working in Bali before returning to his native Canada a year ago. He came back for a visit, and I took the opportunity to ask him about how Bali has transformed his outlook on what's possible and what the island kingdom has to offer the rest of the world. As is always the case on Inside Asia, my interview was not done in a studio, but on location. And in this case, Peter and I lounged along the ocean in the beach community of Chandidasa. I know you're thinking, and you're right, it's a tough job, but someone's got to do it. Here's our conversation. Peter, welcome. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure, thanks, Steve. So I came to Bali in 2010 on a one-year sabbatical. It was supposed to be for 10 months, actually, and we ended up staying for five years, which is not that unusual um, on this island. It, it has a way of drawing you in and, and holding you and, and keeping you. Uh, I had worked for 10 years previously before coming to Bali as a journalist with the CBC, making short documentary films. And when I came to Bali, I freelanced for a few years, for a year and a half, and then teamed up with a couple of foreigners who were all having the same problem that I was having, which was we had crappy internet and we were very distracted from, by working at home. And so we started a co-working space um, and, uh, and just things kind of went from there. Uh, why co-working in Bali of all places? It was a phenomenon that was popping up all around the world. In every major city, you've got a co-working space, but Bali is a bit unique. Uh, can you tell us a little bit of why Bali and, and what made Hubud different? It's a good question. And, and yes, co-working, when we opened in 2013, co-working up until that point had been primarily an urban phenomenon. And uh, I think there was 2,000 spaces w that had already opened by the time we opened it. And yet in Bali and really in Indonesia, it was an unknown kind of concept. Um, and we, you know, like most uh, first time entrepreneurs, we started the, the, the space because it solved our problem. It, it fixed a problem that we were having, which was not fun to work at home, very distracting, a lot of, you know, bad internet connections. Uh, and then from there, it grew, and, and part of the growth that, that happened is, was because people want to come to Bali, because I think that there's a, a sense in the West that there's a lot of people who are unhappy living a typical corporate life, living a typical urban life. It's expensive. It's, there's traffic. There's all sorts of those things that, that weigh you down and that suck your time in the West. And in Bali, you can kind of get away from those for, for a, lot of, a lot of people. And so that was, that was really kind of how it, how it started. 
the internet is the great leveler, and uh, you're right. For the first time, people were able to work remotely, virtually, and uh, instead of going into cities, they decided to break out for foreign destinations, uh, exotic destinations. Bali is absolutely one of them. So there's quite a culture here of digital nomads who spend the morning surfing or mountain biking, and then in the afternoons working uh, on whatever their projects may be. Can you tell us a little bit about the uh, the, the folks who've gathered at Habud? Uh, maybe a couple of the personalities that that, that come to light. Sure, and, and, and you're right, digital nomad was a term that, had, that we were unfamiliar with when we opened, which is kind of remarkable because that has become really the bulk of our membership. Um, and I remember the first digital nomad I met, a guy called Jacob Hiller, who had been um, a college basketball player in the US and had graduated and had realized that he wasn't good enough to have a professional career in basketball. And so he, he wanted to travel and he wanted to do something in the digital space and he said, well, what am, I, what am I good at? Well, I know how to jump. So brilliantly, he took his ability to jump and turned it into a book, into something he called the Jump Manual and started selling it on the internet. And people started buying it, particularly teenage boys who wanted to learn how to jump and dunk the basketball. And, um, and then he got hooked up to this whole affiliate marketing movement and started having, having other people selling his book for him and giving them the majority of the money. And, you know, when we met him in 2010, uh, 2013, he'd been traveling for five years. He had a wife and a child with him. Um, he had been to 32 countries and he was making $25,000, $30,000 a month making uh, these books and selling them online. Uh, and he had a team of, of you know, virtual assistants in the Philippines, and he had a manager back in the U.S. And he was a, a real success story for us, and uh, really the first digital nomad we met. It uh, serves an example, as an example for so many other people uh, as well, and we've seen a wave of individuals come in from all over the world, from, from uh, corporate executives who are burnouts and looking for a little uh, R&R before they go back in, uh, entrepreneurs who feel like they need a low cost base in order to work from, in order to be able to survive and extend the money that they have available to them to build their businesses. There have been others who've come in who've actually been quite successful, started small businesses, worked closely with the Balinese. Could you give us an example of a couple people who've done that? Sure. I mean, I always think about Mona Motwani, who um, came here. She was a human rights lawyer in San Francisco, and she was burnt out, and she was having some health issues, and she just wasn't happy and paying too much in rent. She came here. She took an Amazon course that we were, that we were giving at Hubud on how to sell things on Amazon by a Canadian guy who kind of really figured it out and started selling an Amazon product, a, like a nighttime eye shade and has done really well, has built an entire life for herself here in Bali. She uses that kind of revenue as a way just to kind of keep herself, you know, financially solvent. She's paid off a bunch of debts and she's, she's living, like doing all these other things that she's always wanted to do. So she's a great example. Um, another fellow, Ben Kazitman, who came here and interned with a furniture maker who is a longtime Bali resident from America, an American guy and soon recognized that he too could make things here in Bali and has a real entrepreneurial spirit and launched a company called Wanderer Bracelets, which is now doing, I mean, he's by far surpassed his guru who he started with, who was selling furniture and shipping in these huge containers. And Ben took the opposite tack. I'm going to make small, lightweight things. He's teamed up with a village of carvers here and they carve out of bone and uh, he sells them online. And he's got now 40 people working for him. I talked to him recently and they're moving to a new warehouse in Florida because they can't keep up with the demand. And really a great example of, uh, of a guy who runs his business as a digital nomad. He spends time in Hawaii, he spends time in Florida, he spends time in Bali, and, and yet it's not a bricks and mortar business, but it's a real physical business. It's not a pure digital business. So all sorts of interesting people doing interesting things. It's, it's not all joy and easy street here either, though. Um, you have to have a certain mentality, a certain willingness to accommodate and to adapt to Bali in order to be successful. Uh, what are some of the uh, issues you've seen people face through the years? Well, I think things go wrong in Bali a lot faster than, or, than you, you know, happens in other, other places. There's infrastructure challenges. There's, you know, the electricity goes out. You know, you might, your best worker might all of a sudden have to go home and do a month ceremony because it's an important um, ceremonial time for his family. So there's, there's do definitely challenges that you don't have in the, in the West. I think everyone who's had a business here has faced those. I think consistency is a big challenge. And you know, you and I were talking about this the other day. It's you might find someone who who's amazing and they do amazing work for a year and then two years later they're either too busy or they're they they do not answer your call or 
a whole bunch of reasons uh, they don't do the same kind of work that they did in the past. You, you said before uh, you can't really talk about Bali without uh, talking about the Balinese. Uh, what are some of the kind of cultural anomalies uh, that make this place quite unique and, and, in, and in many ways challenging? Well, I mean, I, I, I think the Balinese are, are unique people in the world. You know, I've been to over 50 countries, probably not as many as you, and I've spent time in pretty much every continent in the world except Antarctica. And I think that the, the, the sense of social cohesion that is here in Bali is un, unparalleled. And I think it's because of the, the Banjar system, the local community hamlet system that they've created. People feel very connected to their community, they feel very connected to their family, and they feel very connected to their village where they're from. And so for ceremonies, even if they're working somewhere else on the island, if there's an important ceremony, they'll go back to that place. And, uh, and you know, Balinese, it's no surprise that when you meet a Balinese on the street, they ask you, where are you going? They don't ask you, how are you doing? They say, Maokamana, which is like the direct tra translation is, where do you want to go? And that's, you know, it's, it's very important for them to situate everyone in terms of geographical location. And, you know, on the island of Bali, Mount Agung is the holy mountain. And the entire, every family compound is orientated a certain way so that the important, like the temples are closest to Mount Agung because that's the holiest place. And in Balinese, the word for, for north is Utara. North actually changes in Bali because depending on where you are on the island, it's actually north means towards Mount Agung, not necessarily towards the North Pole. So I think Balinese are very, they're very connected to Bali in a way that I haven't experienced uh, other people being as connected to the land. Maybe indigenous people in Canada are, are, are also have a real strong connection to the land, mm. but they've had a lot more social challenges than the Balinese have had uh, over the years. And, and isn't that the interest of the irony here is that this, this amorphic aspect of the Balinese culture blended with people who are here as digital nomads or technical wizards, and how do you basically find the continuity or the synchronicity between the digital life and the Balinese life? Yeah, well, there is a lot of ghettoization, there's no doubt, you know? I mean, as expats here, there's a lot of people who, uh, who isolate themselves into expats' communities and only interact with the Balinese in a, um, in a more of like a service way. And that's too bad, you know? I think that's too bad, because I think the Balinese have a lot to offer uh, us as, as expats, as guests here. And I think we have some things to offer the Balinese in terms of showing them that the world, particularly the global economy, is available to them outside of Bali. It's not just people coming here. But, you know, just like Ben's company can take bracelets made in Bali and sell them internationally. Well, Balinese could be doing that, you know, if they had the right skills. And, they're, and a lot of the young Balinese are technologically savvy and are, ga and are gaining those skills. Um, but so there's definitely a, a conflict between the digital life and, and the, the, the more societal life that the Balinese have. Uh, and I'm not sure, you know, it's ever fully reconciled. But... You know, as we've talked about before, in Bali, things have a way of kind of working themselves out. Yeah. There, there's this aspect of ritual in Balinese culture, which is so core uh, to, to the goings and comings of, of, of the people here. Um, you know, as I grew up in, in a Presbyterian upbringing, uh, ritual for me was church on Sunday, and I found that to be in some ways something to not look forward to. I felt it to be, I didn't understand it. I didn't understand the sense of community. I didn't understand the symbology around that. In fact, I was quite bored and agitated by it. But in Bali, ritual isn't something that you wait for on Sunday. Ritual is something that you do in the course of every single breath of every single day. How does that influence the Balinese and, and what are your perspectives on that? Well, I think it, it works on two different levels, ritual and Bali. I think one, it works on a spiritual level. And I think that people are spiritual people. There's, you know, the Balinese see, many Balinese see spirits, feel spirits, sense, have the sense that there's ancestors with them, that there's, there's forces that cannot be touched that are constantly surrounding them. Absolutely. And so they've created rituals to honor those spirits and to connect with those spirits and to express gratitude towards life. And I think that comes out in the sense that, you know, the Balinese are generally okay with the way in which things are going in the world. They don't resist the way a lot of Westerners resist. And then on the other hand, I think that the technologies that they've created, these rituals, if you look at rituals as technologies, those technologies bring people together. They bring people together um, every week, you know, in terms of like weekly ceremonies, they bring them together, uh, you know, for the village community ceremonies. Uh, and so people in Bali are constantly interacting in a way that just doesn't happen in the West, through, through their local banjars, through their local communities. And so I think that the technologies of ritual 
that have been created over the last 500 to 1,000 years here really serve a purpose and have been successful in that purpose, which is to bring Balinese together and to build social cohesion. You had said before that uh, there's a connectedness to the Balinese. In fact, you, you, were, uh, you suspected that uh, when it comes to happiness, there, there weren't a lot of unhappy people relative to perhaps those living in the West, based primarily on the idea of community and the deep ritualist, uh, ritual in, enforced idea of community. How have you seen going back to Canada and, and, and thinking about the life that you had here for a while? What are some of your observations uh, being back in North America? Well, I think alienation and loneliness are two, are two and, and then out of that depression and you know, disconnection from others are, are real very strong forces right now in the West. I think a lot of people go home to an empty house or go home to, uh, to a nuclear family that it doesn't sustain them and doesn't nourish them in the way that, in which the Balinese communities here nourish each other. I, in my experience here in Bali, I have not seen a lot of loneliness. I have not seen alienation. And if, you know, the way in which the Balinese like to work, for example, is rare that you'll see a Balinese working alone. A wood carver or even a, 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 someone working as a domestic person in a house or, or a factory. And any kind of fisherman, any kind of work that Balinese do is generally done in a group. And, and there's, you know, there's something to be said for that about having companions and having like this, there's a shared sense, there's a sense of collectiveness that I think really is a human sense. It's part of what makes us to be human. And I think we've lost that in the West it, through our kind of rugged individualism, you know, which has, has brought us so much. It also has alienated us in, in many ways from each other. You might say in some ways the modern take on co-working has come home to, to nest. I mean, here we are, the original place of co-working, where it all started, and, and yet it took us uh, you know, a couple hundred years to go out into the world and experiment with capitalism and other forms of, of business and commerce in order to come back to this. Maybe that's why you have a bit of a poetry with Habud, the co-working space, and its, its, its affiliation with, uh, with the Balinese culture. No, I really like that. And, and I do think that, that at its core, co-working is about community. You know, I, I, it's, it, we, we used to say, you know, come for the fast internet, stay for the community. Mm. Because uh, it's not that much fun to work by yourself. And there's times when you want to, you know, you're, you're, you're doing writing right now, Steve, and you wake up and you, you don't want to be distracted and you sit down. That's great. But most of us spend a lot of our day interacting with others and, and, and gain a lot from that. Mm. And I think co-working spaces have that opportunity to, to, to allow people to have individual pursuits within a, a community space and a community environment and, and an ecosystem mm -hmm. that, that feeds each other and that there's a lot of learning that goes on, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of growing, a lot of growth. This is Steve Stein, and you're listening to Inside Asia, conversations with Asia's leading movers, shakers, thinkers, and provocateurs. I'm speaking with Peter Wall, who founded a popular co-working space in Bali. You know, corporations have come to this recognition as well. I mean, they're finding that in order to adapt uh, and attract millennials and, and other younger workers and people who are more uh, digitally adept, they're going to have to change up the way that the workplace operates, less hierarchical, more collaborative. Uh, you know, decision making at, at a place like Facebook, for instance, uh, you know, major decisions can be taken by as much as a, by a 25 year old, uh, you know, just two years out of university compared to a 50 year old with 30 years of, 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 of uh, corporate experience. Um, this is the way that things shifting. So in many ways, a co-working is a natural movement towards a more dynamic way of engaging. And I find it fascinating that in many ways it's the original idea, you know, grounded here in Bali. Yeah, I mean, it, it is interesting to see how decisions are made, you know, within the Banjar uh, here, within the local community system, because there is a lot of consensus building that happens. Decis decisions are not made by one individual on high. Now, in Indonesia, um, and in you know Bali on the, as a province, yeah, there's definitely a, a kind of a top-down decision-making um, system. But amongst, and this is true in Java as well, amongst the local community level, there's a lot of consensus building, and people sit around in circles and they talk, and they, you know, there's free elections. Like most of the Banjars, the uh, the, the head of the Banjar is elected. So, some they're appointed. Some it's rot a rotating person. But there's definitely a lot of conversation that happens. 
Well, what other aspects of Bali uh, have you taken back to you, and, and, and what could Bali perhaps offer to the rest of the world? I mean, uh, some of their, their, their practices, some of their ceremonies, uh, Nipi, for instance, is mm -hmm. a wonder, one of my, has become one of my favorite uh, holidays. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about Nipi and its origins and, and, and how you think some of those aspects might be applicable for our technology-ridden world? Well, if you ask most expats here in, Indo in Bali, and really in Indonesia, what their favorite holiday is. Nine out of 10 will say Nyepi. And the reason is, is because I think it's, it's, some, it's medicine that we need, you know, in our, in our, in our connected age. And what's, what's the background on that, Peter? So, so Nyepi is a holiday that happens once a year, every, every, around March. And it's a day where the, the night before Nyepi, there's a series of parades uh, through the streets and, and communities have been building Ogo Ogos, which are these large, papier mache kind of grotesque monster figures often between 10 and 15 feet sometimes even 20 feet tall and they're carried on these bamboo crisscrossed bamboo uh, platforms that the kind of the village men lift up and they're actually quite lightweight they look a lot heavier than they are and they take them out into the streets around dusk and they take them to corner intersections uh, in Ubud uh, they take them outside the main palace and you know spirits are said to ga gather in Bali at intersections. That's why there's a lot of accidents at intersections because there's a lot of bad spirits there. So they go to the intersection, the main intersection in Ubud or in other villages, and they have this kind of like fake fight and they yell and scream and they kind of get, they get the spirits all riled up and then they move on and the next Ogo Ogo comes in. And in Ubud there's probably 20 or 30 different Ogo Ogos from the neighboring villages that come and do this. And then this just goes on for the kind of for the evening and then people go and have fireworks and it's kind of a festive night. And then at six o'clock in the morning, as soon as the sun comes up the day after, there's 24 hours of silence. The, the entire island shuts down. You cannot go out on the streets. The um, radio stations are, are, are closed. The airport is closed. The, the, the hospital is closed. Like you, you, it's remarkable. It's unlike anything I've ever seen. And you, you know, you stand in your villa, you stand in, in, a, in your house and you listen, and all you can hear are the sounds of nature. No, no road traffic, no televisions, nothing. So it's this remarkable day, and it really feels like a, a, a cleansing. It feels like, like, like time stands still. In, in many traditions, they have this idea of, of uh, the, the point in, in certain times of the year where the veil is thinnest between the living and the dead. I mean, the All Souls Day, Halloween, uh, different cultures have different takes on it. What's quite unique about this is the idea is, okay, you're, now you're, 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 the dark side is appearing and you're gathering it up and it's a form of cleansing. And in that cleansing and that purging, what's missing in many other cultures is, as you say, this idea of silence and reflection and meditation. Contemplation. Uh, contemplation. And this is really in many ways the way that... Uh, uh, Balinese actually uh, are able to balance light and dark, which is quite an accomplishment, given that in the Western uh, traditions, it's more about, you know, light at all. Uh, it, it's all about light, and, and dark is something to be basically pushed away or avoided. Yeah, I mean, the Balinese are kind of the original Jungians in many ways, right? They, they, they're not afraid to go to the dark side and to, and to, I mean, they're afraid of the bad spirits, don't get me wrong, but they, they acknowledge that they're there. And you know, there's, there's, I was, I've been listening to a meditation teacher called Tara Brock, and she talks about how you know, Carl Jung said that the more you can bring the things on the dark side into the light and acknowledge their existence, then the less power that they have. And so there's something to be said in Bali about that. And you see that in the, the representations of you know, the masks that are created, the images that are, that are carved a, around the island. Um, some of them are scary, you know, and, and uh, <laughs> you, wouldn't, you wouldn't just go into a church and see you know, depictions of the devil or depictions of, we, we in the West much prefer to hide those things away. Yeah. Whereas in Bali, they really honor them. Yeah, whitewashing them, uh, cleansing ourselves and not allowing ourselves to touch that dark side and therefore, you know, basically come to terms with, with the, the challenges, uh, the travesties, the, the complexities of life. Um, I, I think it's quite telling in this day and age where the West is all about aspiring to material gain or aspiring mm -hmm. to, to accomplishing certain kind of corporate or, or, or career feats. The Balinese are more about flow. They, they seem to kind of uh, adjust and adapt to whatever may come and they do it by and through community. Yeah, and you know, th there's been foreigners that have been coming here for over a hundred years. You know, since the since the twenties, there's been boats that have been arriving. Uh, you know, the sixties, seventies saw a huge influx, and now the you know, the amount of tourists that are arriving in Bali every year now are, is is absolutely unprecedented. Mm -hmm. I mean, somewhere in the 
and, I, and you have to, we'd have to Google this to get it exact. I think it's somewhere around the five million foreigners mm. that are coming, and, and there's only four million people here. Are you concerned that uh, the Balinese culture will be uh, infiltrated and, and, and uh, negatively impacted by this overwhelming wave of tourism? Well, people have been, have been concerned since for the last hundred years, and it hasn't happened yet. So I, I'm not concerned, and I'm not concerned because I think that the Balinese societal structure is really, more than any other place I've ever been, really designed to repel, to be open to foreigners, but to basically to repel, you know, structural cracks. And uh, there's a lot of Balinese who, there's not a lot, most Balinese, pretty much every Balinese is very connected to their community, to their family, um, to, their, to their village. And so uh, I, I think that the, the, the ritualistic, uh, ritualistic structures that the Balinese have created over time are, are an amazing antidote to the pressures and the influences of the West. Now, that being said, are Balinese becoming more materialistic as they become wealthier? Yes. Do, are they becoming more technologically savvy? Yes. And I think that's fine. I think technology, you know, I think that, um, that, that cultures evolve and, and places change. And, and we shouldn't say, the, oh, we, you know, the Balinese should be like this and pick a moment in time and want to freeze frame them in, into that moment in time forever and ever. Mm-hmm. I think that would, that's a disservice to the Balinese. I think just like every other culture, they change and they, and they grow. But they're still very Balinese and they're still very connected to, to their traditions and their rituals. Yeah, this idea of taking the good with the bad. Um, you know, the, the tourists come, the tourists go, but at the end of the day, they still have their culture, their rituals, their community. Um, there, there's a, uh, it perpetuates uh, in, in, in a very positive way and in ways that you don't necessarily see where, you know, uh, other cultures are overrun or, or washed out by influence of, of commercialism and other things. The, it, there's something to be said about the resilience of the Balinese culture. It's remarkable. I mean, when you compare it to a country like Thailand, you know, the Thais have become very cynical towards a lot of tourists and have really adopted a much more Western outlook towards material goods. And, and I don't feel like that that has happened in Bali. I think it's, it's, it's a good thing. Peter, you can take uh, you can take the man out of Bali, but you can't take Bali out of the man. I mean, now that you've been away for 12 months and been returned to Bali for a short visit, what are some of the thoughts you have about um, how you will incorporate the Balinese aspects of ritual and 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 light and dark in your own world and your own life, and actually uh, you know express and and, and uh, share that with uh, with others back in Canada? Well, I I, I feel you know I, I think a couple different things. One, I think the the sense of community that people have in Bali. I, I, I just love it, and I and I think you know if we can if I can bring any kind of aspect of that back to the neighborhood and and the community I'm living with in Canada, I, I think that would be a good thing. I would love to try to do something with Nyepi, you know, on an annual basis in Canada, both offline and online. I I don't know. I'm I'm kind of kicking around ideas with that. You know, it, it it takes a little while sometimes to get a perspective on on a place and going away for a year and then coming back. The one word that keeps coming back to me is like ritual right now and how important that is for the Balinese. And so I, I'd be very interested to, to start doing some work around a, a project around pragmatic rituals. I'm a great believer in, in begging and borrowing and stealing you know, ideas from other people. And I, I, I think it might be time to, to put together some type of manual where we can have these rituals that we can we can look at and say yeah you know what the the idea of nyepi every year is a great thing let's let's do that let's export that to another place or the idea of doing a daily offering which is what the balinese do you know in their in their uh, family compounds and and even in the places where they work so that they're recognizing that there's other forces at play other than themselves those these are all things that i think um the balinese can teach the world so you think these are transferable skills that uh, we haven't uh, uh, denuded ourselves of the ability to kind of adopt other traditions. I mean, the idea of, uh, you know, somebody said the, the air conditioning was the demise of Western culture where people, you know, uh, in the evenings would go into their houses, uh, th- you know, close the doors, close the windows. They weren't sitting out on the stoops or the steps anymore. They weren't mixing and mingling with other people, which is what the Balinese do every single day. Do, do you think there's an ability to bring back these kind of, uh, you know, Balinese-based to ideas about what is right and good and culturally soothing into a, a culture which has really gone in a very different direction. I mean, why not? Yeah. You know, I, if you look at the, the influence, for instance, you know, Java, the island of Java now is primarily Muslim. And a thousand years ago, it was primarily Hindu. 
places change, things change, ideas spread. Mm. And now more than ever, it's easy to spread ideas. And I mean, Donald Trump was just elected the president of the United States. That's insane. That's a crazy idea that I don't agree with, but it's an idea that people bought into. So why won't people buy into ideas that, that you know, they might not be totally familiar with or cultures that they may not be t totally familiar with? Sure. So, so is it possible, Peter, that as we see a flood of digital nomads moving into Bali, in fact, what you're becoming is a cultural nomad moving in reverse, bringing these ideas and concepts from the East back to, uh, to North America. And with that, um, is there a possibility of, of then applying technologies, as you're saying, and, and spreading the word on, on some of the wonderful rituals that have kind of perpetuated the Balinese uh, culture and society? You might have just given me my next project there, Steve. <laughs> Sure, I, I, I like the idea of a cultural nomad. I mean, I think we have to be careful, you know, to, to always be respectful and to get permission. I, you know, I've been doing some work with indigenous Canadians and what I'm very struck with is how important it is it, when you're going to share an idea that you go and you ask permission and you say, this is an idea I have, would this be appropriate? Tell me if it's not appropriate. So we'd have to make sure that, that you know, the Balinese forces are, are, are give, it, give the, an idea like this its blessing. Because there, there are obviously every place has its context and every place has its tradition. And, but I'm a, I'm a big believer. I love globalization. I love the spreading of ideas. I love the spreading of people. I mean, you know, if it was up to me, there'd be no borders in the world. We would all just be, you know. And, and, and the, the cool thing is, is actually, I think, if there were no borders in the world, most people would choose to stay in their home country because most people want to be in their home country. It's where they feel most at home. And if that were the case, then you never would have come to Bali and you never would be able to, to think about the things you're thinking about. And so, you know, Bali is, uh, you know, it is quite a unique place. And, 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 you know, if you think on it, you know, nostalgically, how do you feel about Bali? I feel about Bali like Bali is kind of an ex-lover, you know. I, I was in love with Bali. I really belonged here. I felt at home here. I connected with Bali on, on numerous levels. And now I've been away for a year. We've broken up for a year. And now I'm back and it's nice to see her, you know, and, and I think she's amazing. But I'm, I'm glad that I've moved on. You know, I don't feel a sense of like, I want to get back together. But I do feel like, wow, that was an incredible experience I had. And, um, and there's just so much richness there. But there's a, it's a big world. There's a lot of fish in the sea. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's enticing. And speaking of enticing, Peter, that ocean is calling to us. So I think we should go for a swim. Thanks so much for joining us today. And uh, we wish you all the best back in Canada. Thanks, Steve. That was my interview with Peter Wall, documentary filmmaker and co-founder of The Hub and Abud. For more information, to download our other episodes, or to sign on to get notifications of future episodes, and even for links to the Hubud co-working space community, head to www.insideasiapodcast.com. Want to know more about Peter and his ongoing journeys? Go to www.canadac3.ca for a rundown on a three-and-a-half-month icebreaker voyage through Canada's Northwest Passage in celebration of the country's 150th birthday. Thanks for listening. Until next time, I'm Steve Stein, reminding you that it's a good life, if you can find it, so keep searching. It's only an island's hop away. Mm -hmm.